the mission of God, at the heartbeat of, of his church, at the heartbeat of this church is the mission of God. Last week, Pastor Troy uh, spoke to us compellingly about uh, the mission that Jesus spoke for himself about reaching souls, reaching souls for Christ. And, you know, this, this idea that we look at that being compelled to share the good news is a part of being a Christian, and it is a part of the very heart of God. In Luke chapter 19, if you have a Bible, we're going to turn there. We'll read together in just a few minutes, verses 11 uh, through 27, a very important parable of Jesus. Pastor Troy alluded to it last week, but we're going to, uh, to read it together. But just before the story of the parable, right at the tail end of the interaction of Jesus and Zacchaeus. You remember Pastor Troy talked about Zacchaeus last week, who was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. So he climbed up in the sycamore tree to see what he could see. You remember that? Okay, so that was the depth of theology that Pastor Troy reminded us that you missed out on if you didn't go to Sunday school when you were a little kid, but we just caught you up. So you're all up to speed with what we all learned as well. So uh, it's all even, even fair trade right here. But at the end of the story of Zacchaeus, which is interesting, I, didn't, I never really considered uh, this kind of uh, chapters 18 and 19, as Pastor Troy said them, the story of the rich young ruler compared to the story of Zacchaeus. We have a, a great man with a horrible response to Jesus compared in the next chapter to a horrible man with a great response to Jesus. And herein we find the heart of Jesus, that it is not so much about the manner of the man, it is about his response to Jesus that we see. And in verse 10 of Luke chapter 19, Jesus speaks to us so compellingly, so clear about his purpose and his mission and calls us as his own people to be about the same thing. He says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm about. This is my purpose. This is my mission. If you're wondering why I'm doing the things that I'm doing, this is why. I am looking for, I am seeking out, and I am bringing the good news, the salvation message to those who are lost so that they might hear and respond. Jesus is not just looking for great men that he can enlist into his work. He is looking for horrible men that he can turn around for his purposes. He is looking for men and women, boys and girls. He's looking for anyone who would respond in a manner of yes, to seek and save the lost. You know, oft, oftentimes, and I'll, you know, I need to, to, to stick on the script today because, man, I just feel like the Lord could just you know, just have me preach all day. You know that story where Eutychus falls out the window because Paul preaches all night? We could do that today. You know, but we're all sitting on the ground floor, so we're safe, where nobody's gonna die. But I'm just saying, when we look at the mission of Jesus, and we look at the stories that we see, it's not just that we should say, thank God for Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad he came to do that. You know, as we read the story of the lost coin, we read the story of, of the lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and find the one, where we read the story of the lost son. We think, oh, thank God that that's Jesus' heart. Friends, this is not enough. We're not supposed to just admire Jesus' heart. We have to walk in Jesus' heart. We are called to be people who are after the mission of God. You know, rightly so, and don't mishear me, but a lot of people are upset today about rights and, and, and about uh, convictions being ignored and being forced upon people. People are upset about our rights being infringed on. And listen, we can, we can and should do something about the constitutional rights that we have being thrown aside by leaders. The, the highest authority in our land is, is not our president, it's not our governor, it's not elected officials. The highest authority in this republic and in the state of Washington is the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of our state. And, and we should hold leaders accountable to the Constitution. It is the highest authority. So when the Bible tells us to submit to the authority, this is the authority that all of us, leaders, 
those who are elected and those who elect them should all be submitted to the Constitution. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be, amen, okay, yes. Go America, how's that for that one right there? But let me just drop the other shoe for a second. Many of us, we see this as the battle point, we see this as the place where we're most upset. And I'm, and I'm saying we're right to be upset when the authority of our land is being cast aside. But friends, if we are not equally upset about the lost and broken souls that will slip into an eternity away from the presence of God in the fires of hell, then we are off. If we are more concerned, listen, not unconcerned, but more concerned with rights than we are with souls, we're not right. And this, the, praise God that it's not an either or. Praise God this is not an either or. Do you, do you wanna stand for the rights of people or do you wanna stand for souls? Listen, I mean, we are, we're a church that believes in the mission of God, and we have missionaries, I think, we have, Pastor Troy said last week, 60 missionaries that on a month-to-month -month basis, every month, not month-to-month, -month, every month, that we support them. Uh, we've got missions organizations and partners around the world, and we believe in funding the mission of God. Can I just tell you right now, funding the mission of God is not the same as living the mission of God. For what does it gain you? to save the whole world but lose your own nation. For too long, we as the American church and the Western church have believed in the mission of God as something to fund exclusively, not just something to live out as well. And here we are today, we need to come to this place where we, knew, we know that it's a both and. The mission of God is about souls and the mission of God is about not just seeking and saving the lost, but it is about seeking out all things that have been broken by sin and walking paths to restore them. Education, politics, government, entertainment, technology, seeking out ways that the principles and the people of the kingdom of God can bring restoration for the flourishing of all humankind, amen? Okay, yes. So here's what I wanna do. Let's read the scripture together and then we're gonna get uh, some practical application of this. So would you stand with me? We're gonna read Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And I want you to read out loud with me, as we've often said, it's a privilege to speak out loud the very word of God. Wow, the truth, the timeless truth of God. We read it out loud and together. So starting in verse 11, uh, let's begin together. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over 10 cities. The second came saying, your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, 
taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Father, help us not only to hear and read aloud, but to understand and live out what your word is pointing us to today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we end on, you can be seated, we end on probably not some of the most popular words of Jesus. Take them and slay them in my presence. You know, I want you to just understand, and I'm gonna invite my friend Mark in just a few moments to come and help share uh, what, what is being done and what's at stake here, even in our own state of Washington. But as we look at this parable, understand that a parable is something that we are to, to really learn a lesson from. A parable is not something that we look at and we go, okay, who's the mina, who's this servant, who's that servant, what does this mean, and, and, and what is, you know, it's not like an allegory where every little thing is teaching us, it's driving us home either a singular or at least uh, points within a singular framework. And when we look at it in the context, we see clearly that this parable is about the mission of Jesus being lived out in the people of his kingdom. You know, really just one key phrase that I want to draw your attention to in verse 13. Uh, excuse me, yeah, verse 13. And this phrase, I believe, is, is paramount for us to understand what is the mission of Jesus, seek and save the lost. What does it look like with our everyday lives? Does it look like we, we, we just drop everything and we go out there and all we're about is sharing the gospel? We should be passionate about sharing the gospel. We should be broken and shed tears over those who are far from him. Yes, we should be passionate about it, but it also looks like us living with what we have, working with what we have, not only to save souls directly, but to create a society, to create and to live under such a peaceful place where people can be led to Jesus and it doesn't become dangerous for that to happen. Now look, we trust God with everything. Notice in the story, he tells about a king or a nobleman who is saying, I'm gonna go away for a little while, and when I come back, I'm bringing a kingdom with me. We understand clearly that Jesus is teaching us other things that the Gospels teach us about Jesus who came to earth, who died upon the cross for our sins, who rose again and ascended to the right hand of God, where he waits to be sent once more to gather his faithful to his side, to then deal with and judge those servants who reject him. This is what we understand. But in this, in this passage, Jesus uses a word in verse 13 where he says this to them as he entrusts Amina. By the way, Amina is 100 days wages. So you think, well, Amina, it sounds pretty minuscule. It sounds pretty like miniature. No, Amina is 100 days wages. So that's not insignificant. But in an eternal scope, it's not enough to live on the rest of your life. But he's saying, hey, hey look, this is mine. I'm entrusting it to you. Do business with this until I come back. The King James translates it, occupy until I return. Occupy. And I think sometimes we get that phrase just embedded in our minds and we think that Jesus is saying, build a fortified place and don't leave because the enemy is going to try to take you out. Just stay there and don't do anything, but just wait for me. This is not the meaning of the word occupy in this sense. It literally means to do business. Pragmatuamai is the Greek word pragmatic. It means here is a resource. Do with it what needs to be done with it. Invest it. Use it. Spend it. Build something with it. Do business. Friends, I want you to know that to be a part of the mission of Jesus is to do business with whatever he has given us until he returns. And how we respond to the opportunities that we receive on a daily basis to the needs that we see around us, determines the reward, if you will, and I'm not talking about heaven or hell, I'm talking about the, 
well done, good and faithful servant, that we receive when Jesus returns, and he is returning. Some people say, when? I can guarantee you it's soon. I just don't exactly know what soon means, but I know it's soon. We are about the mission of God. We are about using what he has given us, not only to seek and save the lost overtly by evangelism, but to create a society where the lost are pointed towards the goodness of God, where our business, where our home, our family, our schools, our neighborhoods, our interaction in public is about creating places that have been broken by sin into flourishing places where the principles and the people of the kingdom of God are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody who I know is passionate about that is my good friend Mark Melosha. And Mark, uh, I'll invite him to come up here. Mark is the director of Family Policy Institute of Washington. And um, they, they, he'll describe a little bit of their work, but I think it's important for us in the context of the mission of God and being people of the kingdom of God to hear a little bit of what uh, Mark's background. Now, Mark is the only man that I know who uh, has, he, he has, he has flown B-52s. That's pretty cool. I'm just saying, uh, he has served as a state representative and a state senator for two different political parties. And so I'll let him tell the rest of the story, uh, but I love this man, I'm excited by his passion, and I'm inspired by it, and I hope that you will grab some points of, okay, God, what can we do with what we've been given in the days that we're at? So welcome, uh, my friend and yours, Mark Melosha. God bless you, you, Mark. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, uh, Pastor Jay, for your boldness and passion and enthusiasm. And to you, Cedia Park, I just heard that your, your school, 600 more students, wow, impressive. And, and thank you for your uh, lawsuit fighting uh, for the rights, rights of the unborn, saving the unborn lives and, and going against that abortion mandate we, we have in laws. Thank you for stepping up into this battle. Let me just start with two quotes, and they're connected uh, to what Pastor Jay said. Uh, President John Adams stated, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate, inadequate to the government of any other. Think about that. Then Jesus Christ said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, with a capital T, truth, and the truth will set you free. Our constitution, our government, our nation will only survive if it's guided by moral or religious people. And we know what Jesus Christ says about his teachings. That is what will lead all of us to the truth if we live according to his teachings and true freedom. They are connected. So that's a question I want all of you here to consider. Who am I? Who are you? How do you define yourself in this age of identity politics where everybody's standing up proudly saying they're this or that, in fact, making up things about what they think they are? Well, that's the key question we must answer. Well, I myself has identified as a Air Force B-52 pilot, a Goodwill Industries director, a 14-year Democrat state representative, a four-year Republican state senator, a substitute teacher, a 41-year, actually 41 years, three months, and one day married to Michelle. But as an aside, that's how I count my blessings. Each of us count our blessings in one way, but Michelle started me on the path that I am, and I'll talk about that in a little later. I'm also a father of three, grandfather to 10, and I, I have identified as Family Policy Institute's executive director. But really, the true answer, the true and real answer to who I am, who is Mark Melosha, only came to me after Michelle's persistent caused me to read this Bible. We went to a Bible study, and me wanting to be the smartest person in the room, I started reading the New Testament cover to cover, nine times in three months. But then, those words that I read, those teachings affected me. I wasn't living that way. My values weren't the values in this book. It started kind of a war within my soul. I was stressed out over this. 
Finally, I started realizing I can't stand it anymore. And what do you do when you're stressed out and it all seems unknowable, unlost? You start praying. I started praying to God, minutes a day, then it was hours per day, praying to God, help me live according to your word. One day, unlike any other, I woke up a changed man, on fire for Christ. I knew how to live. I knew who I was. I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to proclaim the gospel everywhere I am. I am a follower. Jesus called all of us to act in that manner, to proclaim the gospel, to spread the good news, to pick up our cross each and every day, even when it seems like the whole world is against you. And let me be honest, anybody paying attention to anything nowadays, the world is against Jesus Christ and his teachings. That is the times we live in today. So we are called, our mission is to not be secular or shy about Christ, but to boldly and passionately proclaim his good news. And there will be folks, the devil, the Democratic Party effectively kicked me out because I was pro-life, pro-family, and I kept on quoting Jesus Christ. They didn't like that. The world doesn't like that. So that is, I realize, that is the mission for every single Christian here in our state, in our nation, or across the planet. That is what we're called to do. So I've been blessed that I've come to that realization. And as the executive director of, of uh, the Family Policy Institute of Washington, I do that full time. My light is no longer under that basket. I proclaim his words daily. So what is the crisis we face here today? Again, just following the news, and it, it, the news is pretty bad. We are in a religious war here in, in America. It's a real civil war. It is not a culture war anymore. It's not disagreements between the political parties anymore or liberals versus conservative. That is not what we face. We are in a type of war that Christians face during the Roman Empire or in during Nazi Germany or the communist China today or the French Revolution. They are coming after your families, your children, your faith. They're using your money to pay for indoctrination programs everywhere from K to pre-K up through school and now they're mandated into the workforce an ideology specifically to destroy Christians and children. Our future is a war America has not experienced throughout its history. But now we are in trouble unless we put Jesus Christ first, live according to his teachings, and proclaim it out loud. Not in here where it's easy, out there, out there. Save souls is our mission. So these ne neo-pagans are back, and I don't have to uh, tell you what has happened. They've joined force with the neo-Marxists, the radical libertarians, the abortion fanatics, um, and now the racist uh, 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 BLM uh, Antifa movements, and they're literally working to stamp out Christianity and families. It's a new woke religion, let's be real. And they're, and they're coming after us. So what should we do? We need to proclaim the gospel before it's too late. If God is for us, who can be against us? We know how this story is gonna end. We know how it's, it's gonna end. But right now, I'm a data person, we've been losing 1% Christians each and every year here in Washington State. We're now down to 47%. The neo-pagans, the non-believers, those people who oppose us are up to 37%. We're going down, they're coming up. Five years, there be a majority. In a democracy, who writes the rules? It's the people in majority. That's what we face. And if there's any sort of doubt on your part that you could hide from this, just stay in your silo. 
or even go to Spokane or Idaho. They're coming for us no matter where we are. That is what we face. They're moving to legalize all drugs. These are the policy bills that we fight in Olympia. They're moving to put Planned Parenthood clinics in the schools. They right now have taxpayer-funded insurance to chemically castrate or to mutilate your children. I can go on and on about the horrible bills going on. It's too depressing to talk about now. But the good news is, and there is good news, is that we know how this story ends up. We will win. We have God on our side. We will win on the issues important to us. Faith and family, religious freedom, Christian social justice, which is frankly the opposite of all those programs you see going on in Seattle. We have to bring folks back to virtue and to God. We have to serve people, the least of our brothers away, at least of our brothers and sisters in the, in the way this book tells us to. That's what we have to do. But that means we have to articulate that out loud. And that's what the Family Policy Institute of Washington. How do, you, how do we address the racism, the, the chronic homelessness, the legalization of drugs, the destruction of family, policy-wise, in Olympia, in Seattle, here in your town here? That's what we do. Educate and make sure we have leaders and we have activists who understand what type of society should we have here in Washington State and in King County. So the good news is not bleak. We will win if we keep to the moral truths that are got our nation to where we are today. And if we remain a religious and moral nation and state, that means we have to evangelize the Great Commission, a great awakening. Those of you who study History knows is when Christians awake, become on fire for the Lord, we win. It could happen this week, next month, next year. But nothing will stand against us when we awaken, we go out there and pick up our cross and fight for what's in this Bible. So that's what we intend to do. We intend to rally folks, get folks to identify as Christians out in the public square, proclaim the good news. And we can succeed. As the song said, we're going to see a victory. We know how this story ends. Our enemy does run everything, everything here in Washington State. But when we wake up, we will win. We will save souls. The Family Policy Institute of Washington is in this fight 24-7. We're giving all that we have for Christ. I'm asking you to consider based on the talents God gave you, just like we, we saw from that reading, based on the talents you have, join this fight. Be a part of this. In a time such as this, in a place such as this, right here in King County, right next to Seattle, if Paul can go to the capital, the greatest and most evil empire the world knew the Roman Empire and speak to the Romans to speak the truth of this gospel publicly, then we can do the same here in King County. We can go to Seattle and pray and bring people back to Christ. Thank you for being in this fight. Let me just end. I, I want to echo what Pastor Jay says. We're here to seek and save those who are lost here in Seattle in Olympia, in the legislature, in the governor's office. All those places are mission territory for us. So thank you for listening. Let me just end with a quick prayer. Oh Lord, strengthen us and help us start the great awakening here in Washington State. Give us the courage to pick up our crosses to fight evil, for we are sinners and give us the strength and wisdom to preach the gospel of Christ to everyone here in Washington. Jesus' mission is our mission. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things that I'd like to ask you to do. You say, Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to pick up what you're laying down. The mission of God, 
uh, is also articulated in our public life. It's not just our evangelism. I want you to take advantage of the resources of FPIW. Uh, Mark sends out regular email updates that um, are very insightful, uh, highlighting not just some of the, the, the strategies that the enemy is using, but legislative updates, important things, ways that Christians can be involved and advocate uh, to bring about, uh, you know, at this level, policy-related change. Uh, and, this, and this is a day for us to wake up. So would also, would you sign up for their newsletter? Sign up for their newsletter. Uh, there's a t they have a table in the back afterwards, some literature and various things. I'd love it. We, we've linked to it in our app. So in the bulletin, there's a link to Family Policy Institute's page. Uh, please, I'd, I'd love it if everybody today would make sure that you're signed up for their uh, regular newsletter. You know, on there, Mark had mentioned a resource where they go through and they basically study every state legislator and uh, show you how they voted on specific issues so that we can know and, and we can hold them accountable. You say, hey, this is not representing the values of your constituents so that we can apply pressure. And Mark is the first to tell you a story as a, as a legislator. I mean, if he's got 10 or 15 phone calls from one position, uh, it may not change his mind, but it's going to make him a little bit weary about maybe jumping down that road in the future, or and we're going to have some price to pay. So I think, friends, your voice makes a difference in the policies uh, of our government and of our state. We, we send people to represent us, and if they're not representing the values that we hold, then we should let them know that. And by the way, we should pay attention when voting time comes around. Pay attention when voting time comes around. Vote bums out, put decent people in. If the decent people turn out to be bums, vote them out again. Just wash, rinse, repeat. That's how a thing works. You know, and, and some might say, doesn't that seem a little too political? I thought we were talking about the mission of God. Listen, if we start to draw lines like that, we say, well, the mission of God only works, you know, at the altar. It doesn't work, you know, in the Capitol. Then we have missed the point of the mission of God. Listen, there is tremendous transformation and value that takes place at the altar. God changed my life at the altar. And I know many of you have experienced miracles and blessings in the house of God. And this is a place of, of blessing and beauty. But I'm telling you right now, God's mission extends to even the godless capitals of the world. God's mission extends to every, not just to the souls that are lost, but to every place that has been touched and broken by sin. So this is what we're called to do. Remember, do business. For how long? I don't know if my Mina is gonna hold up. You keep doing business until he comes. Until he comes. And friends, the, the, the noble man who went off to receive a kingdom came back. Came back, and when he did, he ascertained the work of his people. The work of his people. But he brought his kingdom with him. So friends, Let's make sure that in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, that we're not just saying, okay, God's work is at church and my work is somewhere else. We recognize God's work is my work. And my work is God's work. Amen? Let me pray a blessing over you. Would you stand with me today? Look, there's a lot for us to kind of maybe digest and think about, and I just encourage you, we don't want to just be people who hear, listen, go away, live our lives, come back the next week, wait for some more. We need to be people who take it seriously, walk with the word, listen to what God is doing. Uh, you know, we're, we're reading for ourselves, not just taking others' words for it. We're asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us, and we're taking the time to listen. And I just pray that as you do that this week, that there's a richness and a depth of conviction that develops within you that is the weight and that burden of the world begins to press down and settle down as you sense the battle drawing closer, that instead of despairing and instead of becoming discouraged and depressed, that you would, you would know and you would know, okay, if the battle's drawing closer, that means my God is on the way. That means my God is on the way. And so here we are in a day of victory. And the Lord tells us that when his people gather and they receive the blessing of his word, that he himself will bless them. And so this is the word that I want to speak over you as the gathered church of Jesus today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. And may the Lord smile down upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor 
and give you his peace. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our coming King. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you want to pray at this altar, if you want to come and and ask for some help from the Lord, I'd I'd love to pray with you as well as others. Uh, But make sure that you're able to uh, connect with Family Policy Institute uh, with their stuff there. But may God bless you in Jesus' name. We're so grateful that you joined us here today at Cedar Park Church. We know there's a lot of ways that you could be spending your time, but we're thankful that you are here with us. And we pray that it was a meaningful time, that you were encouraged, that you heard from the Lord. That's right. And even though we're separated by time and space, we want you to know that it's important to us that you're with us today. And we're praying for you and believing in God's best for your life. And whether you're watching online because you're traveling or out of town, or maybe you're just checking out church, we would love the opportunity to say hello to you in person soon. So may God bless you and thanks for spending your time with us today.